History of the Health Sciences lecture series and offered in conjunction with an exhibit that is now um, on display in the Health Sciences Library, an exhibit called Opening Doors, Contemporary African American Academic Surgeons. This is a traveling exhibit of the National Library of Medicine. It will be on display um, through um, much of January. Um, and features, um, it really is looking at the, um, some of the stars um, among African American academic surgeons um, in this country. And some of uh, what we'll be talking about um, today has to do with pipeline issues uh, in academic medicine, and specifically in academic surgery um, for African American uh, physicians. Frequent trips to the hospital emergency department introduced a hyperkinetic, accident-prone, sensitive, and insecure child to the world of medicine. Observing others in the hospital setting who possessed talents and gifts that he did not yet see in himself, this young African-American male was inspired to become a doctor. Dorian Wilson never planned for a career in academic medicine nor as an academic surgeon has he sought rewards in laboratory breakthroughs, research grants, or a national profile. Rather, in developing his own humanistic attributes and in delivering patient-centered care as a transplant surgeon, he has found his calling as an educator, an institutional leader, and a mentor and role model to scores of underrepresented minority students who aspire to become physicians and surgeons. This Medical Center Hour celebrates the growing number of African American surgeons in U.S. medical schools, but the need to swell their ranks remains enormous. Communities, school systems, colleges and universities, and medical schools alike are challenged to encourage and prepare young students to study and succeed in medicine. Increasing the numbers of underrepresented minorities in academic surgery in particular will help to create a more culturally and ethnically sensitive healthcare environment, foster research on minority healthcare needs, and assure mentors and role models for future minority surgeons. Now the Surgery Residency Program Director and head of the Newark-based New Jersey Medical School's Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey Center for Humanism and Medicine, Dr. Wilson today offers his own story as one facet of the recent history of African-American academic surgeons. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Dorian Wilson, who is Associate Professor of Surgery at UMDNJ in Newark, and also to UVA's own Dr. Wendy Elamine, an Assistant Professor of Family Medicine <coughs> and an Assistant Dean for Medical Education. She is centrally involved in recruiting and nurturing students from underrepresented groups who aspire to careers in medicine. You'll find brief bio sketches of both speakers in your handout, along with a short list of references. And I will note that one of the references on your list is written by, um, is co-authored by one of our surgery residents, Paris Butler, um, who has been making a very thorough study of um, the need for more African-American academic surgeons in the United States and in medical schools. Um, again, we invite you to visit the library and see the exhibit that's there. And uh, once again, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Drs. Wilson and Alameen, and we'll start with Dorian. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon on this dreary day. I guess it's better, since you're taping this, if I kind of stay put as opposed to roving around. Okay, so uh, that's atypical. Uh, the only time I stand in one place is usually at the table during surgery. Uh, and in fact, um, one of the reasons, does anybody know what this uh, picture is of? It's Niagara Falls, yeah. Actually, it's the cover of my book, and uh, I put it here primarily because uh, usually, even though I do a fair amount of public speaking, I um, still I'm have a little bit of butterflies when I start talking, so this is really for me more than it is for you. <laughs> but additionally, in doing some of my uh, medical education research for teaching, uh, I was made aware of that interesting photos like this that, attend, that tend to be stimulating uh, help us learn. So there is a dual effect of having this here. And so in addition to stimulating you with pictures, hopefully, and there'll be other pictures, by the way, hopefully I'll do the rest of the stimulating for you. Now, uh, this is best an explanation. I, I thought you folks were, were kind and gentle and not uh, 
<laughs> but I zipped by somebody uh, on the way coming down here, and uh, I didn't think I was too aggressive, but later I saw this in my rearview mirror and uh, gave a new definition to the whole issue of road rage. So apparently you have your own variety of that here in, in Virginia. <laughs> and uh, so as you heard, or as you may know, Dr. Childress uh, came up to visit us uh, almost two years ago now and gave us a lecture on humanism and humanities. And she told a story. So basically what I'm going to do, and it's becoming more and more apparent that stories in medicine are important. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of version of my story. I'll tell you some of how I got where I am and how I began. I'll also tell you two of the principal issues in my life that have become important, one being medical education, the other being humanism, kind of in my idea how they develop and how they relate to me, and hopefully uh, you will derive some benefit from that explanation. So you heard that presentation teaser, uh, and um, uh, hopefully I'll expand upon that uh, in a way that you'll be able to understand. So I started back, that's me, I, I don't know how old I was, my mother couldn't uh, remind me of how old I was, but anyway, I was very young. I was born in 1955, and I was a precocious young child. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why I became involved in medicine is because every year without fail from the time I was five until I was about 13, so about eight years, I wound up in the emergency department with some, uh, some laceration somewhere or a broken bone. And that early introduction into medicine gave me the aspiration to want to treat others as I had been treated uh, as a patient in those early times. Fast forward, uh, high school wasn't much of a, uh, grammar school, high school wasn't much uh, of any great interest or nothing notable until I was accepted, and that's me here, um, with my big hair, like we used to wear back in those days, uh, the A Better Chance. And if you know anything about A Better Chance program, it's a program uh, that was created in Dartmouth for Native Americans primarily. Then it was extended to inner city use to go to more rigorously academic uh, environments. I happened to go to Winchester, Massachusetts. Uh, in a class of about um, 1,500, there were actually 15 blacks. It's about 1%. Uh, that was an interesting experience, and it kind of launched me on into my a later career where I was recognized by Dartmouth, where I later uh, matriculated. Uh, to play sports, although I did run track for most of my undergraduate career, uh, and I decided not to play football after um, uh, getting hit by some of the uh, uh, burly um, people that I didn't get hit by when I was a, uh, a football player in high school. I was 200, over 200 pounds, ran a 9-600 yard dash, so I was bigger and stronger than most people, so I didn't get hit much after I got to college, uh, actually getting hit a couple of times, I didn't like it, so I decided to leave that <laughs> So that was uh, Winchester, Massachusetts. Very interesting program. The program is still in existence and uh, very fruitful. Uh, went on to, after my career at Dartmouth, went on to graduate New Jersey Medical School uh, in 19, class of 1982, as you can see here. Uh, and then, wasn't much uh, interesting that happened uh, doing my residency until uh, this man, whose name is Dr. Benjamin F. Rush, was the chairman of surgery at that time. He knew Tom Starzl, who I'll talk about in a minute, who was a pioneer in transplantation surgery, decided that he wanted me, in fact, to go to the University of Pittsburgh and learn how to do liver transplants. As was mentioned before, I never decided to, or never fashioned myself uh, wanted to be interested in uh, academic medicine. So I did have somewhat of a dilemma at that time uh, when he asked me that. Um, and that dilemma was uh, related to what we know about the numbers in academic medicine, and I'll just go over them briefly. Uh, this is, these are figures from 1998 until 2008, and we're just gonna concentrate on this little bar here, and of course this is female. And if you look, that bar is pretty skinny, um, and it pretty much has stayed consistent. Now, if you think that bar is skinny, uh, this skinny bar is even skinnier for males. Uh, and just to look at what those numbers are, you're talking only about 300, 3,000 uh, black academic faculty members more <coughs> female than male. And if you look at the numbers themselves, that represents 
represents about 3% of about 130,000 academic uh, folks in academic medicine. So we're clearly underrepresented. Uh, last time I checked, uh, African Americans made up about 12 to 15 percent of the population, so uh, that's a number that uh, may be worrisome to some. And part of, in fact, the reason why I guess we're here today talking about what we're talking about. And actually, uh, all along that time, when I was choosing to do a residency, this body, again, that was in 1982 that I graduated from medical school, this body wasn't even in existence yet. The Society of Black Academic Surgeons, in their first meeting, in fact, didn't happen uh, until 1989 at Duke University. Some of you may recognize Dr. Oregon here who passed away uh, some years ago, and Dr. Fleming who were notables in black academic surgery around that time. And since that time, we have people like L.D. Britt, uh, Velma Scanlonbury, with whom I trained in, uh, Pittsburgh, at the University of Pittsburgh, who was for a long time the only woman who could do a liver transplant, uh, Sharon Henry at University of uh, Maryland, trauma surgeon, and of course, uh, many of you are familiar with that person. Uh, and along those lines, in, 19, in 2004, the African American Heritage Award from the New Jersey Organ and Tissue Sharing Network brought all of the current African Americans at that time, actually not quite all of us, if you count the number here, there's 17 of us, there were actually 19 of us in the country at that time, and awarded, they had an award ceremony, as you can see, Dr. Scannell, very here, Dr. Clive Pounder, who some of you who may know, uh, but we'll work together here just to commemorate our contribution to transplantation surgery. And of course, this is the man I studied under, uh, Dr. Tom Starzl. And for those of you who don't know, if you had to identify one person who more or less single-handedly took transplantation of the liver from what it was or what it wasn't to something that is practiced on a daily basis and quite successful today, he's probably the one that you would uh, identify. And in fact, it's, he has an interesting story, and I won't go into it in detail for lack of time, but he actually, transplantation of the liver was not his intentional intent. This was a byproduct of some study that he was doing. As some of you may know, he was a neurophysiologist, PhD, and he was actually studying circulation changes around the gut and around the liver to uh, alter, alter um, glucose and glucagon metabolism. And what he found out by doing some of these weird vascular connections that he was doing, he could actually take the liver out and put it back. So at that time, he was not actually even a doctor. He was studying neurophysiology. So he went back to medical school, became a surgeon, and then, of course, did the first successful liver transplantation uh, in 1963 at the University of Colorado. Does anybody know who this man is? This is uh, Sam Kuntz, and the racially segregated state that he was born in was, was Arkansas. And I put this slide up here because I, thought, I think I would be remiss since I'm following in his footpaths in a sense and his legacy to not mention him. He was born in 1930, uh, went to the University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff, 1948, graduated third in his class in 1952. He got a master's in chemistry in 1956, uh, then the University of uh, Arkansas Medical Center School of Medicine, 1958. Did a two-year research um, uh, at Stanford Service, which was a very elite hospital in Stanford. Um, and then did some study with Sir Roy Conn in, the, in Great Britain, got the GN Giannini Fellowship, uh, Giannini, <coughs> excuse me, by doing my research, found that he was an Italian banker who came over and started the banking system uh, to fund the, the Italian immigrant workers who were doing, who needed funding to, to make their farms work. He developed an arm that was related to medical science, and Dr. Kuntz got that fellowship, spent some time at the Hammersmith Hospital in London. Some of the other notable things that uh, he accomplished were he did the first kidney transplant in a non-identical donor recipient fair in 1961. Uh, he did his he did a, a first renal transplant in Egypt in 1965 as a visiting Fulbright professor. By the way, uh, Senator Fulbright was a fan of his and uh, helped him along in, in supporting him through his studies while he was at the University of Alabama. And then something that's done regularly today. Uh, which I didn't know he was the first person to do this on live 
television, but look at this, 1976, he did a transplant on the NBC Today Show. I thought that was pretty interesting. So that's uh, uh, Samuel L. Coons, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be a recipient of his award, as I said before, by the New Jersey Organ Tissue Sharing Network in 2004. So then I left, I went to university, I went to uh, University of Pittsburgh, did my fellowship, came back, started the program, and then uh, because I had always wanted to serve time in the military, I decided to join the Air Force. Didn't know them in the time, I did all of my training outside of the Air Force. And so, in addition to flying planes, I actually did actually take care of uh, some patients there and did transplants. As a matter of fact, these two stories, the flying in a T-38 fighter, and taking care of this gentleman are related because this guy was the key top recruiter for the military the Air Force at that particular time. He had Bud Carey syndrome, needed a liver transplant, and so the general, who was his primary report, uh, came to the hospital one day after his transplant, which was successful, by the way, and said, did you ever have a notion to want to fly a plane? And I said, of course. I'm in the Air Force, I mean, after all. So he got me this ride in this uh, plane, and of course, uh, uh, don't ever trust people when you don't know, because my captain who who, um, who took me on this airplane ride told me it was like flying in a car, so of course I went out beforehand, I had my whole gear and my whatever, and I lost part of it uh, coming down, so that wasn't too cool. Anyway, uh, it was fun though. And actually they offered me a ride in an F-15 after that, but this was quite enough. <laughs> Anyway, and my claim to fame during my my, uh, my Air Force days was getting my picture on the front of the Airman magazine. And actually, this was a fluke because the only reason why I got my picture on is because the chairman of transplant surgery was supposed to be on the cover. His mustache was not regulation. So the Air Force, yeah. So the Air Force refused to put him on the cover. So my mustache was regulation, so they stuck my face there. So, but that's a story that I won't tell anybody. Okay. So, when I left the military, things were a little cloudy uh, because um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And one of the reasons why I left the military because of the downsizing, etc. They decided to um, uh, basically abolish the transplant center. So I came back to New Jersey, and I was well received. Uh, and I was in limbo then for a few years because I went back. Uh, I started in the emergency room. My transplant position was not open. Uh, to me, so I worked in the emergency room for almost three years, and then I finally got back to transplant, but still was kind of having trouble finding my way. So, uh, as history was having, I went to Bolinas, California, and I, are many of you familiar with Rachel Remen? Anyway, Rachel Remen, the Healers Art Program, she is involved with helping doctors heal themselves, basically, so that they can do a better job of healing their patients. So this was the view from uh, the compound where we stayed for five days healing ourselves uh, during Rachel uh, Rivens Healers Art Program. And that was my beginning of learning about humanism because shortly thereafter I was uh, made the interim director for the Healthcare Center for Humanism. And I'll just give you a brief history of what humanism means to me. Uh, most notably I want to concentrate on this phrase about doctors caring for patients. And this is Hippocrates, and as far as I'm concerned, he's the first father of humanism. And the reason why is because not only did he dispel the whole supernatural cause of illness, i.e., you got the gods angry and therefore you're ill, but gave some concrete reasons of why you might be ill, um, resulting as an imbalance from uh, blood, phlegm, bile, and yellow bile, etc. Uh, but also, of course, with his statement. Uh, doctors should practice no direct intervention uh, in the natural healing process. And this is a really key statement because back then they didn't have penicillin. They didn't have much in the way of therapy. What they did, they had observational medicine, so they observed medicine, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if somebody could tell you from their observation that what you have is going to pass and you'll be okay, that was something that was pretty good to know under those, under those circumstances. So again, again, you're talking about 460 B.C. I'm not going to go over this, but I just wanted you to know that there was a document that was much bigger than the one that we cite today uh, that was a forerunner for the Hippocratic Oath, which is this, what, which is what our students uh, um, uh, 
say today. So, and then some of the words that I want to point out, words like uh, sacred, loyal, uprighteous, there's that word care again, inviolably, happiness, faithful. These are words that the whole Hippocratic Oath is built on, and um, these are some of the tenets of the Hippocratic Oath. First, there's a, dual, a loyalty to the traditions of medicine and then to the well-being of patients, and of course, most of you know this phrase, premium non necessary. Um, so there's the Hippocratic Oath as we know it today. And this document is related to the medical ethics, the principles of medical ethics, which was first um, uh, coined by this fellow here, Sir Thomas Percival. Interesting history, uh, this gentleman. He in cahoots with this gentleman, who some of you may know, David Hume was a philosopher. And actually Hume was considered a renegade because he hung out with philosophers. He lost his place at Oxford and had to go to the Manchester Infirmary because uh, he was considered because he was good in cahoots and uh, cavorting with philosophers. Uh, that wasn't accepted at that time. Uh, so he lost his place in the normal flow of <coughs> people who studied medicine at that time in the uh, 17th, uh, 18th century. So anyway, the first document that they created was called the Medical Ethics um, Institute of Precepts, and that was, as you can see, around 1903. Um, actually, the first document, however, you can see, this is May 9, 1847, and this became the forerunner, and I'm just going to skip this because it's not relevant, but this became the forerunner of our own Code of Medical Ethics for the American Medical Association, which here was uh, updated in 1958, and then again in 1980, and then the last rendition uh, with changes that were made in 2001. An important change that I want to bring to your attention here is they eliminated the, the word service and they replaced it with care. And there's an interesting history, I won't go over this, I just wanted you to know that, again, this AMA principles had a lot of those weighty words that we saw in the Hippocratic Oath. So in my mind, at least, they are uh, identical and very much related. And just for completeness sake, I presented the six principles of medical ethics being beneficence, uh, beneficence non-malfeasance, autonomy, justice, dignity, truthfulness, and honesty. So again, there's that word care again. And probably the person who made this word famous was this man. Does anybody recognize that man? So that's for Francis Peabody. Very interesting story around this man's life. He had a very uh, traditional upbringing, so to speak, for that time. The father was on faculty at uh, Harvard, the mother was wealthy. But the thing that probably most affected his life was his brother, Darby, when he was 10, brother was 6, died of tuberculosis. Major impact on his life. And as a result of that, he became this caring, humanistic physician. And his claim to fame probably is most notable a paper that he wrote back in 1927, um, The Care of the Patient. And tucked away in the last paragraph of that paper is this sentence. And uh, why don't you read that last sentence starting from here for me. There. The good physician knows his patient's through and through, and his knowledge is... No, start here, please. Oh, yeah. one, of, one of the essential qualities of the physician is interesting may for a seeker of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Now, the, that sounds like circular, right? The secret of caring for the patient is in caring for the patient. Um, but it actually is profound in a sense because it brings us back to really wanting to connect with the patient, to hear their story, et cetera. So Francis Peabody, he had a happy, happy excellence in training, intelligence, industry, and relations. Um, he also was a triple threat. He did good clinical medicine. He taught well, and he did research. And this is something which probably some doctors could take uh, a lot of uh, uh, instruction from and that he was humble. And in his own words from that, from that article, he says that the practice of medicine in its broadest sense includes the whole relationship of the physician with his or her patient. It is an art based to an increasing extent on the medical sciences, but compromising much that it still remains outside of the realm of science. What is that that remains outside of the realm of science? Well, that human dimension of the patient, caring for them, uh, in terms of their 
relating to them as people, their culture, etc. So what's nice about humanism is that the physician's attributes and actions that demonstrate interest and respect for the patient and then involves and addresses the patient's concerns. And what we might also include here and replace this word with not only their values but their culture. And what's the greatest thing about humanism and something that we don't generally talk about which is inherent in humanism practice is that not only is humanism good for the patient but it's good for the practitioner. So we started our humanism program and this was our first uh, humanism uh, dinner. I take the humanism scholars out. I did at that point uh, by myself originally and I didn't take a, a picture the first year but this is the end of the second year and we had 11 scholars at that time. We just had our um, dinner here and as you can see the group has grown uh, with lots of supporters and uh, our mission statement is this, uh, we foster the ideals of respect and dignity for individuals as we provide service committed to relieving suffering and kindness, justice and humility while employing self-reflection and continuous development. We're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit more as we talk about medical education. I'm on time here, I've got about seven more minutes and I can finish up easily. So. Um, I used to always put a, a, a picture of an azalea bush that I used to think was a rose bush and I was educated because I, <laughs> I put the azalea bush and I said, isn't this a pretty rose bush? And somebody in the a student in the audience said, that's not a rose bush, that's an azalea bush. So now, just <laughs> parenthetically, I know the difference between roses and azaleas. <laughs> anyway, so that's a rose. And so more history. So Abraham Flexner, now we, we're switching gears here a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about medical education, something that's also, in addition to humanism, is, is close to my heart. He obviously created the Flexner Report in 1910, uh, which is when this report was um, uh, presented to the Carnegie Foundation, who supported it. And what was going on in medicine is that at that time was that the public was concerned about the administration and development of medicine and how it was taught. Does that sound familiar? It should, okay, and I'll show you why in a second. Um, their organization was made of medical education in such as a way to obscure in the minds of the public any discrimination between a well-trained physician and a physician who has no adequate training. Again, maybe applicable today. Um, the man who settled his tuition bill was essentially going to receive his degree. Another bad thing. It, it, was a bad, it was a business proposition more than anything else, and probably a poorly run one at that at that time. And then Flexner in the report itself wrote, each day students were subjected, notice the language that he used here, suggested to interminable lectures and resuscitations. After a long morning of dissection, and then you can read the, the, the rest by yourself, um, they were taught by part-time teachers, and if they were fortunate enough to get uh, interest to a hospital, they observed more than they participated. Uh, bad situation back then at the time of the turn of the century. And actually, this thing was kind of funded. Adam Flexner was actually a school teacher. Abraham Flexner was actually a school teacher who had a background uh, and had received his degree from Johns Hopkins. So John Hopkins, being one of the private institutions at that time, was kind of going to kind of beat down all the state institutions who had these bad organizational issues. So that was part of how this was generated. But again, they brought to light a lot of issues that were inherent in medical education at that time. Unfortunately, some of those are still with us today. And here we are, 100 years after the, uh, the uh, Fletcher Report, we're still concerned with the fact that we may be in medical education. Notice the first line. Medical education seems to be in a professional state of unrest. Emphasizing scientific knowledge over biologic understanding, clinical reasoning, practical skill, and the development of character, compassion, and integrity. Wow, right? So it's more than just a question <laughs> of medical knowledge. Uh, that guy looked familiar to you. Um, and what the public thinks <coughs> is important, right? <laughs> Just a little elaborate here. Okay, I'm going to put my filter back. <laughs> so, obviously, the Institute of Medicine in 1999 wrote this uh, to Air as Human, and you can't break it out here, but it says 
about 44,000 and maybe as many as 98,000 deaths due to accidental mishaps in medicine that can be preventable. So we're concerned still today with the kind of doctors that we're, uh, that we're producing. And of course, in your handout, I think you've got, uh, this book was referenced, Luke Mira, he's a historian and a uh, doctor, professor, excuse me, professor of medicine at um, Rock, Wash Your Right in St. Louis. And again, it gives a very, very compelling and exhaustive review of how things like war, uh, medical education reform, research, and the development of Medicare, Medicaid has affected medicine. Can't go into that. It's way beyond the scope of this lecture, but just know that it's it's a very uh, good uh, reference for that. And still today, we're talking about reforming medical education, assessing medical education. And this young lady, this is a nice position, ladies. This is Libby Zion. She died in the New York hospital in 1984 under mysterious events. There's a whole thing that goes beyond, the, again, the scope of this lecture. But it seems like when we mess up with people and people die in hospital sins, we always deal with somebody high profile. Her father was a, a prosecutor in New York, New Jersey, and actually did some writing for the New York Times. And uh, he went on a rampage after she died because apparently it was due to a mishap with her getting the wrong medication and interacting with something that she had taken. Of course, unfortunately, she was the uh, person who had practiced polypharmacy and multiple drugs were in her system when they did the uh, drug analysis. But anyway, she died, and that was the wrong thing to have happened. So after the Bell Commission and looking at um, all the events regarding work hours and way, ways in which doctors may uh, um, uh, function when they're impaired from sleep deprivation, et cetera, duty hours were um, regulated as we see now the 80 hour work week. But the other thing that came out of that was the learning environment. Um, and this is part of the outcome project by the ACGME, which is the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. There were two goals for the outcome project. One was developing confidence as a physician. One was in improving uh, patient care. And of course, some of you may notice, those of you who teach residents, the, um, the uh, competencies, practice-based uh, learning, patient care, professionalism, et cetera. So we have competency-based edu education. I'll just uh, let you read that, really. It's self-explanatory. We like to think that our competence-based education will lead to learning outcomes that will be consistent with our goals and objectives of the curriculum. The learning and teaching together will produce outcomes that we are, um, that we reject as desirable. This I thought was pretty telling about what some people think about what we're producing as physicians today. Today's medical schools are pro producing square pegs on our care system around holes. This problem requires the immediate attention and we need a strategy for retraining damaged goods. We're creating damaged goods. And this Dr. O'Leary, and, I, I, and I, whether this is valid or not is not the point, but this is a person who's in a place of influence saying this about, about the way we're training physicians today. So we have a problem. And medical education, goals and objectives are not currently necessarily consistent with the apparent outcomes. We have yet to develop a model for truly learning-centered education. We need to restructure the learning environment um, with additional resources that do not appear to be readily available. State institutions like ours have uh, issues. And uh, one point that I wanted to make on this slide, and I won't belabor it, but the millennials. We probably are not necessarily doing what we need to do. Some of you may know just like you have baby boomers, generation extras, et cetera. Well, the millennials are that group that were born between 1982 and I think 1994. And most of what we see in the majority of uh, students in our medical schools today. And unlike the baby boomers who we were intensely loyal when there was a cause, baby boomers, they don't care. If you can't give them a valid reason for doing something, they're not gonna do it. So we need to address that in terms of how we're teaching them and we may be not doing such a good job at this particular point. So what does Lou Mera say? He says that academic health centers are fragile institutions that need aggressive nurturing, sustained protection, and the unwavering support from uh, those in vision, those with vision, power, and means. And specifically,
specifically in surgery, I am wrestling with the, the fact that maybe surgery is an impairing for the profession. It's impairing because of the toxicity that we still see in surgery, et cetera. And of course, we need a paradigm shift for educational reform in that respect, inclusive of women and that being the way of the future that women are here to stay, uh, as well as some other issues that we need to address in terms of making surgery less toxic and more user-friendly. So, in concluding, I'm not sure whether um, some of you may be familiar with this uh, picture, and if you're not, I'm sure you're familiar with the Bible story about the Tower of Babel where God confounded the languages of many and that they weren't able to communicate. I think that's similar to what we're seeing in medical education today. We all have good goals, we all have good thoughts, but we're not necessarily talking the same language. So as a program director, one of the things that I teach my uh, residents is I tell them that, you know, what's important to me is that I care about you as a person. I want you to be the kind of person who walks onto a ward and people come to you to engage you rather than turn around and walk away. Um, I know they're smart. I know they're going to be technically uh, competent. I told them that I could teach a monkey how to sew the portal vein. Probably, no doubt, have taught a few monkeys how to sew the portal vein. You didn't hear that from me. Um, but anyway, I tell them that I care about them with pe as people and we generally have a pretty good time. And of course, the last thing I want to leave you with is the whole issue of mindful practice. And basically, what mindful practice uh, says is that mindful practitioners attend in a non-judgmental way to their own physical and mental processes during ordinary, everyday tasks. This critical self-reflection, again, as I'm wording in self-reflection, enables physicians to listen, listen attentively to patients' distress, recognize their own errors, refine their technical skills, make evidence-based decisions, and clarify their values so that they can act with compassion, technical competence, presence, and insight. Additionally, mindful practitioners use a variety of means to enhance their ability to engage in moment-to-moment -moment self monitoring bring consciousness to their tacit personal knowledge and deeply held values, and use peripheral vision and subsidiary awareness. I have no clue what subsidiary awareness means, <laughs> but use your imagination. Um, to become aware of new information and perspectives and adopt curiosity in both ordinary and novel situations. What that allows me to do, mindful practicing, to me, it allows me to teach Tai Chi to my uh, medical students. And this is one of the things I'm very fond of. It takes me out of that role of being a, a doctor and cu cutting out livers and putting in new livers and lets me do something that helps me reflect. And the students enjoy it too, and that's one of our sessions. And some of my mentors, other than the one I've mentioned, other than some I've mentioned, are people like Wayne Dyer, Rhonda Byrne, Eckhart Tolle, and David Hawkins. Uh, these are books that I would recommend to you that have helped me align myself with doing my reflection and spiritual uh, pursuit. And so my last word to you is when things get cloudy and you're not kind of sure about which way you should go, if you look hard enough, the sun is going to be peeping through somewhere. So thank you for your attention. I wanted to uh, talk to you all today about his strategies to strengthen the medical pipeline because uh, Dr. Wilson is a product of a pipeline. He talked about his experience at the age of five being introduced to medicine, even if it was on an emergency truck. Um, some of us don't have that opportunity, so it's important that we're taking the time to ask children, what do you want to be when you grow up? Many people say by the age of five, it's almost too late and the playing field is not even. They say that 35% of kindergartners are not even prepared to go into kindergarten. In some places, in some inner city schools, they have shown that children in kindergarten only know nine letters if they're from an inner city area. But if they're from a middle class area, they know 22 letters. So you see that there's a difference and we need to make sure that the playing field is even so that every child has an opportunity to reach their dreams. Some of the barriers that uh, Dr. Wilson alluded to are legal policy problems, educational problems, the social, cultural, financial, and economics. I was uh, down in Atlanta last week and I asked a gentleman why um, he had not gone to medical school and he said, you know what, I just don't want to take out that type of financial burden. To take out that financial burden was too much for him to bear. Another issue is recruitment and admissions to make sure that every school values diversity. When I talk to students, some of the barriers that they talk about are society. People don't necessarily see them as a potential physician. 
the images that are out there on television, media plays a role, stereotypes, and even family. Family can sometimes be a barrier for people being able to achieve their dreams. So some of the things that I try to do in my program is to say that we have five objectives, and I call them the five E's. Each student we meet, we're trying to expose them to medicine, help them to evaluate where they are, help them to realize how they can evolve, look at the mistakes that they may have had in the past or some of the barriers and how can we erase those and to elevate them to the next level. And we have really adapted a holistic strategy here at the University of Virginia. Uh, one of our strategies is to implement the Sales to Society program, which many of our medical students are familiar with. But we've taken this to the undergrad level and shown them how on the cellular level um, they can learn HIV, but also how does this impact the patient, how does it impact society. And this serves as a source of empowerment and inspires them. Recently, we started a gear up program at Charlottesville High School. We had over 60 students that were a part of our program. To see them put on white coats for the first time and step across the stage and to feel that they had the potential to be a physician was very powerful for them. Also, personal development, we have many mentors here at the University of Virginia. We're making sure that our students have patient contact, shadowing experiences. During the summer, we have the SRIP program where we have students who come on to our university to receive research experience. And another thing that Dr. Lewis Sullivan started was an alliance, and that's the Virginia-Nebraska Alliance, and that's where we pair up what we are, a TWI, a traditionally white institution, with HBCUs, which are the historically black colleges and universities here in the state of Virginia. So we have many students who come onto our campus to receive new information, to bring that back to their campus, but also we're receiving information about their experiences that are very enhancing for our school. And then lastly, uh, we're trying to provide support, and we do this through supporting the SMA program, and recently we embarked upon the Appreciative Inquiry Project that I'll talk about in a little bit. The Sales to Society program that we have implemented, we have focused on HIV recently, on sickle cell disease, and also diabetes and obesity. We've been targeting the Daniel Hale Williams program, which is the group of African American undergraduate students on the campus of the University of Virginia. And last year, we actually had five of those students to come to be a part of our first year class, which we're very excited about. So some of the objectives for the Sales to Society is to make sure that we're developing a collaboration. Instead of just doing recruitment and going out to different schools and talking about how wonderful the University of Virginia is, we want to make sure that we're imparting information and we're collaborating and looking at ways that we can enhance the curriculum at each institution that we visit. When we talk about individuals making it through the pipeline, some of the themes that have come up are determination, the resilience, having a strong sense of ethics, tenacity, a willingness to take risk, and the ability to bounce back. When we talk about the people who have truly made it, when you look at them, they have a toughness of character, they have stood past the endurance test, they have survival skills, and what we call the three T's, a tough mind, thick skin, and tenderhearted. And many of these are trailblazers because when they look around, they may be the only African American in those situations. And they have also made a personal sacrifice. One of the things I think is important is uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Carol Scott from the AAMC, she said every person needs a mentor. But it's more important if you look at yourself that you're the CEO of your own company and you're developing a personal board of directors. So you need different mentors. So each one of our students, we try to make sure they have a coach, an advisor, somebody that's going to sponsor them, that they have role models, an advocate, somebody that's going to listen to them, a peer, counselor, and also a guide. So make sure that when you're mentoring people, tell them it's not just important to receive information from me, but to develop a holistic approach. Mentoring is important because our students need to have allies through all the hurdles that they're going through. They need to be able to benefit from another person's experience. There's no reason to keep repeating the same mistake over and over again. And also, this person can become a lifelong help for career advancement. Some of the solutions that I think that we need to do as far as mentoring is develop mentoring best practices. Not everybody is a good mentor. We develop toolkit for success for mentors. And also, maybe an e-mentoring program and make sure that we're awarding <coughs> people for their mentoring and looking at the promotion and tenure process is valuing this. It's important that our students know their history. Most of the time when I go out, I ask students, so tell me about an African American who has contributed to medicine. And the only thing they're able to say to me, Dr. Charles Drew and Dr. Ben Carson. Two people. 
we are a part of history, and that's why it's important that we have the exhibit here from the National Library of Medicine to make sure that our students are exposed to all the contributions that African Americans are making in the field of medicine. Dr. Lewis Sullivan wrote a report, the Sullivan Report, after the IOM. And what he stated is that, you know, we are missing persons in medicine. Minorities in the health profession uh, are missing. And he said that we need to develop some serious strategies. Some of the strategies um, we have talked about are going to help build this resilience. And I wanted to stop briefly and look at resilience. Resilience is defined as a dynamic process encompassing positive adaptation within the context of significant adversity. Most of our resiliency studies have looked at children and how they've been able to thrive in toxic environments. Uh, Dr. Jensen, out of the University of Pennsylvania, said that there are the seven C's of resilience. And I want to go through this briefly because you can impart this upon some of the students that you are mentoring. You need to be confident, be competent, be connected to have those resources, that board of visitors, uh, directors that we just talked about. Also to have character, contribution, be able to contribute, the ability to cope, to have control over your circumstances. Sometimes when we see people drop out of school and they're not making it to the pipeline, they have no control over their circumstance. And also they need to be cared about. So one of the things that we've done here at UVA is to develop the Appreciative Inquiry Project. And we've done this with our SMA students, our residents, and also our attendings. And what we've asked them is, what is it here at UVA that makes it possible for you to thrive? And some of the stories have been amazing. What have you contributed to the University of Virginia? Many of our students, our residents have made tremendous contributions and also to tell a story. Think about a time when you were really at your best and you knew University of Virginia was the right place for you. And these stories are going to be put together. Uh, Dr. Reynolds and I have been uh, doing this over the last year to really inspire other people to come to the University of Virginia. But we're developing a pattern of what is a resilient environment, what's here at the University of Virginia that's allowing us to make it. And I'm going to stop with this since uh, Dr. Wilson put in his Tai Chi. Has anybody ever heard of Mia? Mia is Neuromuscular Interactive um, Action. And in Mia, every finger stands for something. So the thumb, babies, they suck their thumb, so they're trying to nurture themselves. So we have to find out how can we nurture our students, our residents, and our attendings in these environments. The pointer finger, when you go to the mall, you say, I want this, I'll take this. This is your desire finger. What do you desire for in your life? What are your ambitions? Where do you want to reach in your life? And the middle finger is your power finger. What do you have power over in your life? What do you have power over that's going to help get you through this medical pipeline to the next level? And then your fourth finger, do you all know what this is? Commitment. This is your ring finger. When you get married, this is your commitment finger. What are you truly committed to to make sure that none of those barriers are going to get into your way? And then your pinky finger are boundaries. We need to make sure that we're holding up boundaries, that we don't allow anybody to make us have deferred dreams. We have control over our circumstances, and we need to make sure that this environment here is a resilient environment and that we're also helping our students to be resilient. So I'll go ahead and stop here for questions with uh, Dr. Wilson. both for wonderful presentations and we have several minutes for um, your comments and questions and I think they're, uh, if you want to both sit up there, I think they're willing to uh, entertain almost anything from any of you. So. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Claire Thomas. I'm a first year medical student here um, and also a former member of Daniel Hill Williams um, as an undergrad. My question is for Dr. Wilson. You mentioned a program that you went to in California about healing as a physician so that you could heal better. Could you speak more about that and what that entailed? Well, Rachel Remen, Rachel Remen is, uh, she's a pediatrician and uh, by trade in medicine and she developed during her medical school year, she developed Crohn's disease and she had to have a colectomy and an ileostomy. And her interactions with the medical uh, community at that time, her doctors and such, was such a horrifically disturbing and painful experience that she decided that doctors were not uh, humanistic enough and caring. I don't know whether humanistic was the word that she used. So she decided that um, one of the reasons why, and I don't know all the, the permutations of what her thinking was, but 
some of this had to do with their own limitations in terms of um, the way that they hadn't healed themselves, carrying perhaps some latent uh, frustrations into their practice with people so, such that they weren't able to give the caring that they needed to give to people with difficult problems. Again, you were talking at that time about someone who was trying to become a physician, who was trying to then be healed from a very devastating situation where she had to have something as as, uh, as atypical and as disturbing as a permanent ileostomy. So she developed this course. And apparently, as I was made aware, you have a Healers Art elective here um, at, at University of Virginia. So, and basically, we, we first of all, there are two components to the Healers Art. One is that uh, you come into an environment and you're honest about your feelings. And the reason why you can be honest about your feelings is because the environment, one, is, you know, like they say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, this is the environment that you have at Bellinas, California, which is where uh, the, the healers are for physicians take place. Um, so we were able to divulge things about ourselves personally that uh, probably many people, their experiences, they hadn't told people. It was a very interesting environment. We weren't able to eat meat for the four days that we were there. Again, part of this cleansing, etc. So uh, you can look up Rachel Remen and the Healers Art on the internet and find out more about it. But that, in a nutshell, is what it is. Uh, thank you both for your uh, presentations today. I'm Julie Conley with the Center for Bioethics and Humanities, and I, I just wanted to respond to this question uh, about Rachel's work. Um, myself and a group of UVA physicians volunteer and teach the Healers Art. It's five sessions. We teach it. Uh, uh, in the winter, uh, January, February, March, generally it's open usually to first and second year medical students, but third and fourth can do it if they can meet the schedule. So you'll be getting a notice in the next week or two about it, so uh, you can sign up for it if you want to. It's a great course that Rachel's designed. It's taught now in, uh, I think, about 75 of the medical schools in the country and many uh, schools around the world. So it's a really good course. Other questions? Thank you for these beautiful talks. Uh, my name is Samuel Lukodono, and I'm a second year here. And I wanted to know, on, and that's a question for both of you, on the path that led you to where you are today, what was the toughest challenge, and what was the best weapon that you used to address this challenge? Question. And I interviewed you to get into medical school. I never knew you'd be asking me questions. <laughs> um, I think that the hardest part has really been trying to maintain authenticity. And that's being who I am in every environment and making sure that I'm reminded of why I've been placed in different environments. I've had the opportunity to be uh, in private practice. Um, I've had the opportunity to work in prison. I've had the opportunity to work here at the University of Virginia. And I think that I bring a uniqueness to all of these positions, but most of the time I'm one of the only ones and I have to make sure that I check myself and I remain authentic. And uh, what I've done to do that is just maintain, you know, mindfulness, stepping back, getting in alignment with myself, um, and then making sure that I have the right mentors to make sure that I'm nurtured in these environments. I mean, uh, Dr. Sharon Hostler, Dr. Norman Oliver, Dr. Canterbury, have all been very significant mentors who have said to me, you know, we need to utilize your gifts, talents, and abilities here. And being in alignment with that has been very instrumental. I would have to echo uh, those sentiments. Uh, we talked last night in, uh, amongst a, a, a small group of students in the evening about um, the whole issue of circle of influence. Uh, Stephen Covey, who you may know that name, wrote a book called, wrote several books, but the one that I'm particularly citing at this time is called The, the Seven uh, Traits, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in that book, he talks about the circle of influence. And what basically the circle of influence is, is your own clinical, yeah, not clinical, your own personal attributes that you have, whether you're a people person, whether you're very smart in mathematics, whatever it is that you do and you do well, that becomes your circle of influence. And if you, again, stay, as Dr. Elamine has said, if you stay with 
within those boundaries. Of course, we're going to grow and we're going to do things in other areas. But if we accentuate and enhance those boundaries and our circle of influence, something miraculously happens. Miraculous happens. Our circle of influence grows. And so, and in order to maintain your circle of influence and find out what it is, your purpose, so to speak, you have to be true to yourself, as was just mentioned. So that uniqueness that you bring, whatever it is, for instance, myself, when I explained to the students last night, I decided some, somewhere along the line because of my basic personality, I was humanistic. I became the director of the Humanism Center, of course, because of my people skills. Then I become the director of the program in general surgery. So that circle of influence will grow. It depends upon, it, it's necessary for you to find out who you are, what your purpose is, with, react, react within that, and then try and expand it. And that, that will happen. And as far as a, a critical experience or something that I have to overcome, um, I, I guess I can't really cite anything. Um, clearly, there are a series of challenges that we have that may or, not, may, or may not be notice, uh, notable. However, in my daily experience, I think I would tend to negate those and put less emphasis on them and put emphasis on my triumphs as opposed to my trials. So that's probably why I can't bring anything up at this particular moment. Time for maybe one last question. Okay, I'll be right with you. Should I start without it? No. Because while the microphone is going over there, the other thing, Sammy, I mean, was I really feel like we're in a state of emergency. You know, sometimes I am tired and I don't want to have to keep going, but because I see uh, patients in my clinic that, um, are in dire situations, there's something that kind of presses you to keep moving forward and keep doing what you have to do. It's kind of like whatever you've been given, much is expected from you. So once you've been given the opportunity to heal, to be a physician, every opportunity you have to have an influence, you have to step up and to take that. And sometimes it's hard, but you have to. Uh, my name is Forrest Callan. I'm one of the um, surgery faculty members. I'm the medical director, one of the medical directors for the general surgery service and the trauma program. Um, what would you say to the person who reflects on what's happened for the last 10 years and notes that in surgical training, you know, that perhaps surgical training is falling apart? You know, the concept that with increased humanism, uh, decreased work hours, uh, decreased accountability, decreased responsibility, that, you know, the trainees are leaving training, unable to care for patients independently, requiring additional mentoring once they enter practice. Uh, you know, this is a, a tremendous challenge for somebody like me who you know, at times felt as though my skin was on fire uh, while I was training. Uh, and yet, as a faculty member, there are times when I'm intensely grateful for every painful moment that I went through because they prepared me to be able to take care of people in difficult circumstances today. I fear that many of our residents uh, today have a much different training experience, and I'm not sure it's for the better. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. You hit the nail on the head. and I, I'm. You know, having gone to the program director's meeting uh, back in April, I believe it was in Utah, it's clear to me in surgery that the RRC surgery, the American Board of Surgery, and the ACGME, they're clearly not talking the same language. And we do have a crisis. I mean, um, the, the work week issues, uh, the more, uh, the, the parameters that we're trying to measure to determine whether we're creating good surgeons or not, are not necessary. Certainly, they haven't been proven to be uh, of uh, in an evidence-based way that these are the things that we're supposed to be looking at. So we're running around like chickens with our heads off, and we do have a state of emergency in surgery. So I, I certainly don't have the answer. Um, what I have tried to do on my own small scale, in my own small way, at my program, is try and appeal uh, to the residents' um, uh, uh, moral constitution in, in a way in terms of them taking care of their patients uh, with maybe speaking out of both sides of my mouth sometimes in terms of the 80 hour work week, uh, but it is what it is. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to penalize a resident if that resident stays an hour beyond their work limits to make sure that the patient's safe. So, but we do have some issues and I, and I feel for you, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say that to Dr. Lipson at the, at the ACGME, but, um, but uh, I have my own ways of addressing things at home. <laughs> We've come to the end of our hour. I'd like you to join me in thanking Drs. Wilson and Alameen for a wonderful